This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit about what makes the Bitcoin network so special. And in order to talk about this, we're going to compare and contrast it with the US dollar network and other fiat dollar networks. And we're going to think about this as a monetary network with nodes. So I want you to visualize something like this. This is kind of your standard network and each of these dots is a node. You can see that this is peer to peer. They all connect to each other. Now the US dollar network is a little bit different, but there are similarities. We have sort of at the top, we have the US, uh, the US central bank, the Federal Reserve. Below that we have commercial banks, and then we have you and I who are the customers of these commercial banks. The commercial banks deal directly with the Fed. We deal with the commercial banks. The Fed is not just the Federal Reserve itself, but it's all the member banks, the 12 Reserve, the 12 Federal Reserve member banks that are in different regions of the U.S. And they're in all the major cities of the U.S. like Boston, New York, Chicago, um, Dallas, San Francisco, etc. So this is the basic structure. You have what you might think of as kind of the central node which is the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the US. You have satellite nodes, which are the Federal Reserve member banks that we've talked about, and then nodes that connect to them are the commercial banks, which would be like Wells Fargo and Bank of America that you and I deal with. Now, the interesting thing about this, if you look at it with fresh eyes, is that you need special permission to become a node on this traditional network. The US dollar network and all the nodes on it it turns out are, not surprisingly, highly politicized, not neutral. There's just a very small group of unelected people like Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and his committee, the Federal Open Market Committee. They get to decide the supply of money and the cost of money. The cost of money is just interest rates, and that's why you hear a lot of people talking about what the Fed is going to do with interest rates. But it's really bizarre when you think about that this very small group of people gets to decide the supply of U.S. dollars and the cost of of money and have so much control over interest rates and over the Fed money printers. Central bankers, they like to fly around the world and talk to each other. They fly around on private jets. They go to exclusive gatherings at Davos and places like this. But then at the same time, they get to pick your pocket through monetary debasement and inflation. And inflation is like a hidden tax. It's used to fund the government indirectly by funding deficits through the, through the money printers, but it's a lot like taxes in that it takes money out of your pocket and decreases your purchasing power. It turns out, unfortunately, that we don't get the best people as our central bankers. Nice, nice boys and girls don't grow up to be central bankers. Central bankers are always these bad economists. They're investment bankers, ex-investment bankers, they're lawyers, and they're other rent seekers who provide basically zero value to society. These are not the people who invent the next iPhone. These are not the people who are doing manual labor or new inventions or working in laboratories and creating new things or writing new software. These are the worst kind of rent seekers. Here's the Federal Reserve. Here's the board of governors and then the, the uh, 12 Reserve Bank presidents that we talked about. We can cross off Richard uh, Clarita. He was uh, forced to resign because he was trading using inside information from the Fed. He basically switched from a bond fund to a stock fund the day before Jerome Powell basically said that he was going to pump up the stock market. So it's even worse than this. You have all this insider trading that's involved with this. And there are a couple other governors who are doing it as well. Uh, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan and uh, Fed President Eric, Eric Rosengren also uh, were doing this sort of insider insider trading uh, last year. Over the pond in Europe, the ECB has the same problems. They have uh, Christine Lagarde as the head of the European Central Bank. And of course, she is a criminal. She was already convicted over payouts and bribes when she was the head of the IMF. But this is this is just to give you the kind of flavor for these type of people. They are not the high priests of finance. They are not especially educated about how these things work, but they tend to be more political toadies that work their way up the system. People like Janet Yellen, who also go on both sides of the of the fence, they work the US Treasury, they work the Fed, etc. And you have this revolving door between bankers and regulators. US dollar network, as we said, highly politicized, also highly permissioned, as are the dollars that ride on that network. The US dollar assets are highly permissioned. You need permission to become a node 
on the US dollar network. You can't just start a bank without getting permission. And if you do run a bank, you're subject to enormous political pressures. You basically need to do what the US government says, lend to these people, don't lend to these people, freeze this person's account because of their political opinions or something they did. And so there's this extension of the US government's power through the US banking system. You can't open up a bank account without getting permission. You need to apply for it. Sometimes you'll get turned down for various reasons. You also cannot send or receive US dollars without getting permission. You need to have a bank account to do this. You need to be able to send a wire, in other words, a Fed wire. The one exception that's still around is cash, and this is in the process, physical cash, and this is in the process of being banned because the government doesn't like that it doesn't have as much control over it. You can exist in the physical cash system in the US or outside the US and not really have to interact with banks. You can be sort of an informal node on the network. And this is one of those loopholes that central bankers and politicians want to close. And once we get a CBDC, a central bank digital currency in the US, which would just be sort of a blockchain version, a highly spied on blockchain version of the current US dollar, this is going to get even worse because we won't have cash. Every transaction will be monitored by the government. Every transaction will be permissioned and it can be turned off, reversed, uh, or, or not turned off, depending on who you are. But even under, under the current system, your US dollars can be frozen or confiscated at any time. You might log in one day to your Wells Fargo account and find that it's been frozen for some reason. This can happen too if you're a sovereign government. This is something that the US, that Russia found out the hard way earlier this year when they invaded Ukraine and all the G7 nations froze Russian central bank assets that, that were being held uh, in their countries or with their central banks. So Russians were holding, uh, were holding US dollar assets. Those got frozen. This is something that's been happening to Iran for many years, really since the Carter administration. This can happen to individuals, as I said as well. Here's an article from a legal blog about what to do if the US government freezes your your bank accounts. Now, this was very popular. There is actually a government initiative under the Obama administration, which went on until about 2013. This was called Operation Checkpoint, Operation Choke Point. And what it was, this was driven by the United States Department of Justice. And what they would do is they would put a lot of pressure and investigate banks that were doing engaged in activities that the government didn't like. And I'm not going to say I'm a fan of all of these things, uh, but it is a little bit ridiculous when you take a look at uh, ammo sales, ATM operators, cable box descramblers, online gambling, uh, firework sales, uh, pawn shops, payday loans, etc. Some of these things, telemarketing, dating services, some of these things are a little bit more mild. Some are probably not things you want to happen in a civilized society. But the, the interesting thing about this is this was not done through Congress. This wasn't done directly through the executive branch either. This was a way of enforcing, enforcing various activities through the banking system. And it wasn't done in a very transparent way. This had to be disclosed in a Wall Street Journal story. So whether you, you like these activities or not, and again, I like some of them, I don't like others of them. Uh, but this was something that uh, really highly politicized the dollar and the U.S. banking system for U.S. residents and U.S. citizens as well. Now, you might think that Russia is a bad country. They invaded Ukraine. Iran is bad. Gun dealers are bad, et cetera, et cetera. But if so, if you're going through what I've just done here and you're deciding which things you like, and which things you don't like, you've really missed the whole point. And the whole point I'm trying to make is that money needs to be neutral. The best form of money would be neutral and you wouldn't have someone, some centralized group, politicizing it and deciding who can use it in what way and who can use it in another way. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, you might not like fiat dollars to be used to purchase meat and vice versa. And so you could see how it can become really ridiculous and um, how, how politicized fiat money can be. It's great to ban and censor your enemies. Maybe you don't like Russia. Maybe you don't like Iran. Maybe you don't like ammo dealers. It's great to ban and censor your enemies, but someday you're going to get banned and censored too, depending on who is in power. So we've talked a little bit about the US dollar network. We've talked briefly about the nodes on it, the assets that ride on it, which are US dollars. And the way they're moved around is using a settlement system 
called FedWire. If you've ever sent a wire in the US, you know how this works. You usually pay $30, $35, and you can send a larger amount of money, and it clears that same day. In other words, it settles that same day. If you're buying a house, for example, or funding a brokerage account, you can use those US dollars the same way. So this is a settlement system that is very secure, and it's very difficult for these transactions to reverse if you accidentally wire money to a scammer, it's very difficult to reverse that transaction. So this is a final settlement transaction. This is called Fedwire and it's obviously run by the US Federal Reserve. You need you need permission to use Fedwire, you need permission to be a node on the US dollar network. You can't send or receive US dollars without getting permission, either sending them through a wire, through Fedwire, or through ACH where you need your bank's permission to move US dollars. So that's the US dollar network and the nodes on that network. And it's not this is just not true with Bitcoin. And this is what makes the US this is what makes the Bitcoin network such a special monetary network. The Bitcoin network is open to everyone. Anyone can plug into it and mine Bitcoin, send Bitcoin, receive Bitcoin, validate Bitcoin transactions with a full node. And in order to do any of these things, you don't need special permission from centralized some centralized authority. You don't need a special license or a degree. You don't need a license to mine Bitcoin or to send Bitcoin or to hold Bitcoin. And this is why the Bitcoin network is so special. Bitcoin is both a neutral monetary network, anyone can join and participate, and a neutral monetary asset that exists and is sent along uh, from node to node on that network. And this neutral monetary asset cannot be confiscated, cannot be frozen in the same way that you can on the US dollar network. There really is no alternative to the Bitcoin network. You can use a highly politicized central bank network or fiat currency network like the euro network or the US dollar network or the yen network, or you can think of sort of this global fiat network, or you can use the Bitcoin network to settle transactions. There's no alternative. Do you want Fedwire as your settlement network or do you want Bitcoin as your settlement network? There really is no other neutral settlement system besides the Bitcoin network. It's not the Solana network, which is run by VCs and is not secure and it's constantly being paused. It's not the XRP network, which is uh, right, uses an asset that was issued by a corporation that's being sued by the SEC. It's not, it's not the Binance blockchain. It's not the Ethereum blockchain and network. These are not neutral settlement systems. They're also highly politicized and not even that decentralized. Here's a, a funny page that someone sent me from Amazon Web Services in which Amazon itself discloses that 25% of all Ethereum workloads run on AWS. So this is a highly centralized monetary network. You can make one call to Infura, one phone call to Infura, which is used to run most of the nodes on the Ethereum network. And you can make one phone call to Amazon Web Services and you can completely shut down the Ethereum network. The Ethereum network also has a history of reversing transactions back in the DAO hack in 20, uh, 2016 when this money was, um, some, some ETH was stolen. The decision was made from the top it was essentially made by Vitalik Buterin and the, and the lead developers to reverse this large transaction. They did a, a hard fork of the network and basically were able to roll back a transaction and pretend that it never happened. The people who still believe in Ethereum Classic, they're running on that old network and that old asset. But modern Ethereum is a result of the DAO hack and then the, this, this rollback of the debt, the DAO hack. And again, you can't have a, a neutral settlement network, a neutral monetary network where you have someone in control like this and where transactions can be reversed and forked away. This has never happened with the Bitcoin network. I've only mentioned mentioned a few networks here. I've mentioned Solana and Binance and uh, Ethereum and XRP. Please don't tell me about your tiny little crypto network that is either so tiny that it doesn't matter has a market cap of 100 million or less or trades just $50,000 worth of your crypto per day, or it, it's a network, a, a crypto monetary network that's controlled by VCs that has large pre-mine. In other words, tokens were initially distrib distributed to insiders and as such, the incentives were skewed forever 
or a project that's controlled by developers or that runs on proof of stake. These are just ways of recreating the US dollar network and the fiat financial system. These are not neutral, powerful substitutes for the US dollar network. There's only, only the Bitcoin network. None of these other networks are going to make it simply because Bitcoin not only has the neutrality that we've demonstrated, it has the decentralization, it has the global reach and the global brand. It also has this huge head start. You could try to start something that was very idealistic, that was as decentralized as possible, where you had a very fair initial distribution. But even if you did everything right and you built it on proof of work as well, you would not be able to catch up to Bitcoin. Uh, you could you could fork Bitcoin, you could recreate Bitcoin. We've seen the Bitcoin forks fail. Bcash and BSV are complete failure, dead projects that have depreciated versus B, versus BTC versus Bitcoin as a uh, as a monetary asset. So you can try to do this, you can try to restart things, but history has taught us that no one will ever catch up to Bitcoin. It's the initial digital scarcity. It's the it's the first digitally scarce asset. It had this immaculate conception, the founder left, and it has this global reach and global neutrality. As time passes, the US dollar is going to lose hegemony. The US dollar network is going to be used less and less. Iran doesn't use it anymore. Russia is certainly not going to touch it. China doesn't want to touch it. Foreign central banks and governments will increasingly use the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin itself as a reserve asset and as a global settlement network like Fedwire or like SWIFT, which you have in the, in, uh, the EU. Bad countries are going to use the Bitcoin network, countries you don't like, maybe like North Korea or Russia or Iran, quote unquote, good countries are going to use it. Of course, these good countries, uh, sometimes a, a country like Germany or France is a good country to the US and sometimes it's considered a bad country. So these labels are always changing. And if you live in Iran or Russia, you obviously probably don't think your own country is a bad country. So it's always a question of perspective. But the nice thing about a neutral settlement network and a neutral global monetary network is bad people, bad countries, and good people, good countries can use it. And the same country might be good one year and bad the next year. It'll still be able to use Bitcoin. And this is because Bitcoin is for enemies, as the saying goes. It's for your enemies, and unfortunately, it's even for my enemies. Bitcoin is a neutral asset. It's a neutral monetary network. It's apolitical. It's for every tribe and every race on earth. It's for the left, it's for the right, and it's for the political center as well. As we said, there's no alternative as well. You can use Fedwire, you can use SWIFT, you can use the Chinese monetary network, or you can use one of these more modern monetary networks like Ethereum or Solana, which are not neutral. But if you want something that is neutral, that's open source, that's permissionless, that, any, that anyone can plug into and use, and that has credible forward monetary policy that's not having its monetary policy changed every six months, like Ethereum does with these new hard forks and move from proof of work to proof of stake. If you want something that's neutral and unchanging and stable and secure, and this is what you should want for your money. You don't want all your money in a startup that could fail. You want your money in a secure, network that's not going to get hacked as we keep seeing with all of these uh, bridge hacks in the other crypto uh, among the other cryptocurrencies you can't use gold either gold was tried and found wanting the reason we have the fiat standard now is because gold is very centralized and it ended up all in vaults and then governments used it to uh, create their own fiat currencies that weren't backed or completely backed by gold the gold network is not the way you want to settle settle transactions in the 21st century. You can't be flying gold around the world to settle trades. You can't be putting it on boats. This is a ridiculous thing. You need, you need transactions that settle very quickly. You need a digital asset and you need a digital network. And this is Bitcoin. Bitcoin has al already won. It's better than the gold network. It's better than the Euro network. It's better than the US dollar network. It's already won just not everyone has realized it yet. I'm going to be doing some traveling, so no new videos tomorrow, Saturday, or Sunday. But if you have some extra time, I'd encourage you to check out the rest of my videos on YouTube. I'll link to this page below where you can see all of my videos and you can catch up on Bitcoin as well as central bank policy. 
If you have some extra time, you can also check out my paid course on Bitcoin, which is really when you want to take your understanding of Bitcoin to the next level, when you want to go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. If you find my way of explaining things to be helpful, you're going to love this course. And I also have lots of practical lectures in here, how to buy Bitcoin anonymously, how to use CoinJoin, how to buy non-KYC Bitcoin, how to set up your own Bitcoin full node and connect a hardware wallet to it, how to do a do-it-yourself multi-sig etc. as well as some sort of more philosophical lectures about Bitcoin's natural superpower, empty block attacks, how that would work, the real reason that Bitcoin is so volatile, etc. If you're interested in seeing all of the notes from this lecture, uh, from this video or other videos, it looks like YouTube has sort of changed the way these show up. You'll have to go to the page. This is from yesterday's video. And you can look at the top here where it says open description. You can click there and then it will open up on the right side of the page. It looks like it's doing this sometimes and sometimes it's not doing this. But you can also click right here to get the link for my uh, paid Bitcoin course and all my trading courses, which are available at Trader University. You can click right here on the courses tab and you can see all the trading and investing courses that include uh, momentum stocks, trading options, trading futures, dividend stocks, price action trading, as well as the, the Bitcoin course. But if you're ever watching one of my videos on YouTube and you wanna see the links that I'm referring to, and I'll do it for this video as well, you can click right here on open description, go over here and scroll down and get all the links to what I'm talking about in the video. So you can do your own research, make up your own mind about Bitcoin and see if you agree with my take on Bitcoin, the monetary asset, and the monetary network. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. If you want to check out this paid course, you can just click on the link in the description notes below. And I hope you all have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday on YouTube here with a new video. Thanks a lot for watching.